Um, so welcome everybody in this room and also uh, online. This is the already the second um, convergence lecture in this um, busy month um, after we had uh, Manuel Herranz here from Pangeatic only about 10 days ago, I think. Um, I'm very, very pleased to um, welcome uh, uh, today an, an international guest who has come uh, to us from quite far away, Professor uh, uh, Masaru Yamada, who is coming uh, from Rikyo University in uh, Japan. Um, uh, yes, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to CTS and to the university. Um, <clears throat> I remember that nearly on the day two years ago, um, you and your colleague um, Kayo Matsuchita mm -hmm. um, presented at a, at a panel that Elena and I was organizing for the IATIS conference. Um, that was on simultaneous interpreting, yeah. <laughs> another complex topic. So um, today, um, well, you can see how in this uh, two years the world has changed. Not only that now we can actually much better be uh, here again in the same room, but also we have a phenomenon that you will be talking about called ChatGPT. I won't say anything about this because Felix will introduce you in the talk um, properly. I just wanted to thank you for coming um, and also wanted to thank you for all your hospitality towards Felix when he went on his uh, trip to our, around the parts of Asia not so long ago. Um, it's, it's very nice to see that we can have some perhaps more closer collaboration between your university and the College of Intercultural Communication and uh, our center. So we look forward to the talk and we look forward to talking to you later also. Thank you very much. And now the floor is uh, Felix's. Sorry, this is a bit uh, complicated here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share this session, but the, the actual person who's going to uh, star is uh, Masaru Yamada. My role here is just to make sure that um, everyone enjoys the, the session and is able to ask the questions to Masaru. Um, and as Sabina has explained, this is a hybrid event. We have people in the room, lots of people. It's fantastic to see such a crowd. And, uh, and we have also lots of people online. And there are different rules for how the session is going to go on. So Masaru is going to present for 40 minutes, 50, one 60, hour, one know. hour, or less. That's the time that we uh, agreed. Um, and then we will have at least 30 minutes for questions, OK? Uh, there will be a microphone going around for people in the room. And as for the people who are attending online, you may have seen that the chat is disabled. You will not be able to use the chat, but you can use the Q&A feature, OK? In the Q&A, future, you um, you can write your questions and they will be there. They are not lost. So if you have questions while Masaru is presenting, you can already put them there. People may upvote your questions. Um, and at the end, Elle will be selecting some of the questions and asking them to Masaru. Okay. Uh, so that's more or less what we have planned. I hope it goes well. And so what I just need to do is to Thank Masaru for Thank you. being here. Um, it's a privilege to have Masaru Yamada with us today. Uh, he works in Japan and he's uh, an experienced person in this world of professional translation and interpreting. He has worked for many years as a translator. Uh, and then he also has a very long career as an academic writing about lots of different themes. And currently he has started working with ChatGPT. He wrote a book about it. And he's going to tell us about that. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the session and we'll ask some questions at the end. Okay, Masaru, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve and Sabrina Veria. Nice introduction. I think this is the largest audience I am giving a talk and the, uh, I'm a little bit nervous, I think. And also, I don't know how many people it's going to be online, maybe over 180. <laughs> okay, oh well. All right. Uh, so as a uh, as Felix uh, just mentioned. So I'm going to talk about uh, basically how to use ChatGPT for translation, but the title is Enhancing Translation Accuracy and Efficiency Through ChatGPT. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And oops, this is not working. Okay, Oop. wait a minute, okay, okay. how can I? No, the mouse, ma somehow the mouse is not. Okay, 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 all right. 
Okay. Uh, yes, because, okay, I think the first half I'm going to completely rely on the script that I prepared, but that's, I, I hope it's okay. <laughs> so, okay, it's, it's great pleasure to stand before you today. My name is, again, Masaru Yamada, and I am, from a pro I am a professor at Rikyo University in Tokyo, Japan, specifically within the College of Intercultural Communication. My academic, you know, I've been to the United States to, uh, to finish my undergraduate and then the master's degree, my master's degree in the linguistics. Then I got a job with a Ford Motor Company as an in-house interpreter and a translator. So that's how I built my career as a professional translators. And after that, I uh, uh, established my own translation company and became an independent translator. It, that, that career is very similar to Felix, I, I think, I suppose. And after I worked a couple of years as a professional translator, I decided to go back to get a PhD in my 30s, I guess, and at the Rikyo University. At that time, I focused on uh, the translation study, especially the interaction between human and the machine and translation and CAT tools and all that. So now the, uh, my uh, research preliminary uh, involves around a few intriguing areas. I have a uh, uh, profound interest in the empirical pro translation process research, TPR. And I work closely with Michael Carl in the, uh, the Kent State University in the United States. And we looked at the various aspects of translation technologies, such as computer assisted translation CAT tools and machine translation post editing. And I try to integrate that idea in the language teaching area. I call that a translation in language teaching. It's called a tilt. So that's the another uh, the area that I have developed in the recent years. So I look forward to sharing my knowledge and insight with you today. So that's a kind of uh, introduction. And uh, today's presentation will delve into ChatGPT, Honyaku Jutsu, the book that you're looking at. It's a translation of ChatGPT Chat translation skills as published in the Japanese language recently, actually in September, 2023. And so I will introduce the core principles of this technique and discuss recent research in relation to this topic. But those are the book that the top one is the one that I focus on. But after a month, uh, another uh, Japanese book published called English Education and Machine Translation. So this is another area that I told you that I'm uh, interested in recently. So before getting to this, so this book is not targeted for translation scholars. This is a uh, targeted audience is more like the uh, Japanese people studying English, but they are interested in uh, D disseminating the information in English globally so that they need translation from the Japanese language into English. So that's how I think the use for uh, the chat GPT will be for. So, so that I, I'm saying that just in case. Then also there are some other limitations that, that I will discuss in the later in this presentation. So the first of all, how the chat GPT different from conventional machine translation? In terms of technical aspect, both conventional neural machine translation and ChatGPT utilize the transformer architecture developed by Google. While their foundation technology is similar, there is, can you, okay. Are they having, okay, hearing me? Okay, okay. Uh, so there, that the foundation technology is similar. There's a difference in amount of machine learning applied impressively ChatGPT is multifaceted. Beyond only translation, uh, ChatGPT can perform a variety of tasks. This suggests that ChatGPT integrates the capabilities of traditional machine translation, both broad and specific. In terms of translation accuracy, nuances exist. For the English-Japanese pair, translations from Japanese to English are notably more accurate than vice versa. So this trend might be consistent across other language pairs. So leading to into a varied translation quality depending on the directionality, I, I would say. So that this book primarily focused on translation into English, not into Japanese. However, 
However, it is essential to note that employing chat GPT for translation isn't exclusive to into English translation. I posit the prom, uh, prompting approach uh, explained in this book can be adapted for any language pair. So I think the information that I'm providing it should be useful for your language pair as well. And the, currently in Japan, a national project named LLM.jp is in progress. So its goal is to develop a Japanese variant of ChatGPT on par with ChatGPT 3.5 by the end of this year. So if this is achieved, I think this could enhance the accuracy of translations into Japanese language as well. So that's the technical aspect, but I think we wanna know more than this one. So the, from user's perspective, so how are ChatGPT and MT different? There are two main distinctions when it comes to ChatGPT. So there are two things. The first one is the ChatGPT offers the unique ability for users to inquire about the language and the translation outcomes. This feature sets it part apart, and I will provide a more detailed example later. But basically what I'm saying is users of ChatGPT can ask questions about translation outcomes. This is a diff so different things. And the second is the ChatGPT can be uh, seamlessly incorporated into the industrial translation production process. This point might sound ambiguous, but I will clarify it with specific example in the following segments what those things mean. So the difference one, users can ask questions. I just show you the examples. It's in an abstract actually. So that Japanese phrase, okay, translation from Japanese into English, right? So Japanese phrase, phrase watashi tachi wa unaji kama no meshi wo kutta naka desu. The literal translation means that we used to eat rice from the same rice pot. Okay, and so you put this uh, Japanese sentence into uh, the machine, existing machine translation, and you get the answer. We used to eat rice from the same rice pot in English. Imagine that you are not, uh, you know, you, 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 you are not a good English speaker. And then the user may wonder, does this translation effectively communicate the intended message? How should this be determined, right? And so that's a, so this question highlights the limitation of uh, the conventional machine translation. Accurately assessing the machine translation's output often demands advanced foreign language or translation proficiency from the user, creating a paradox like needing a licensed human driver to supervise the safety of autonomous vehicle. Right, so uh, it doesn't make sense to have an automated uh, machine translation because you don't know the target language and the source language. So that's the limitations. However, ChatGPT is different. So the large language models like ChatGPT introduce a new scenario. Users can directly ask ChatGPT whether the machine translation output accurately conveys the intended English message as demonstrated. So you can ask questions like this. Okay, so this is the exact question that you write, you know, to convey the Japanese expression, watashi wa onaji kama no meshi wo tabeta naka desu to English speaking friends. And one machine translation translates it as, we used to eat rice from the same rice pot. Does it make sense to the target audience or the speaking uh, people, right? Then chat GPT can respond. You can get a response from those. Okay, maybe I should read this. The expression we are friends who ate from the same rice pot is a particular Japanese idiom whose deeper meaning may not be fully understood by English speakers if translated directly. This expression does not only mean that we share the same meal, but also we share the same experience and hardships, which depended our uh, camaraderie, I can see that, and bond. So therefore, we all ate from the same pot may not fully express its spiritual side. So if this phrase are to be expressed in English, expressions such as we, we have been through thick and thin together, or we have shared the same hardships, maybe closer. I mean, so you know what I mean? So you get the idea. So this is more, you know, more than what 
uh, the existing machine translation can do for you. So that's the first one difference. The second difference is, oh, that, that's <laughs> Chuck to DPO game anyway. So integrated to the workflow, uh, the real translation can be done. What, what do, do I mean by that? So machine translation has been the straightforward process. The you input the original text and the system outputs the translation. Uh, essentially, its role was confined to translating the provided source text without any deeper contextual understanding. So it's a bad thing, you know, you just give that source text input to, into the machine translate. They just translate without asking us any questions. But for you think about the professional use, for the professionals in industrial translation, uh, translation agencies or the translation companies, other practical translation fields, this approach can seem almost surreal. How can a machine translate without understanding the translation's purpose, the purpose of a translation, its intended audience, the text type, uh, the also the necessity of groceries and style guides and other nuances? They don't understand those. And from the vantage point of working translator, traditional machine translation seem quite detached from real world application. As a result, human translators often find themselves post-editing machine translation, post-editing machine generated translation to ensure quality and relevance. But, but ChatGPT is different. The ChatGPT brings a notable departure from the conventional MT. Uh, ChatGPT Chat allows users to provide not only the source text, but also additional context like translation's purpose prior to execution. The contextual approach mirrors standard practices in the industrial and practical translation. In essence, AI technology is now starting to grasp and incorporate nuances typically reserved for human understanding. This evolution suggests that ChatGPT is primed for integration into practical workflow and translation. So the shift, is, shift in capability is uh, very significant for ChatGPT. The essence of leveraging ChatGPT's potential lies in crafting precise instructions and asking right questions. So here's the, the, uh, the use of meta language because paramount. So basically, uh, ChatGPT, you can give instructions like the purpose of translations or all that, and they give us the better uh, the result on the translation in the context. So the keyword is how you prompt them, right? So the meta language plays an important role. So what is the meta language? Meta language is the linguistic tool set we employ to describe and discuss language and translations. Many individuals can proficiently translate and speak a foreign language. We speak foreign language, but we often struggle to articulate why a particular translation or expression is apt. The comprehension tends to be intuitive and unconscious rather than explicitly analytical. So we, 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 you know, we translate it. Then I think we think the translation is good, but you cannot explain why. A lot of people are like that, but you, you need to, you have to have the ability to explain why your translation is good or the better than others or something like that. So for that purpose, you need a meta language to explain about your translation, your translation quality and all that. But however, the experts in the fields like linguistics or the translation studies and those in roles such as project management and quality control process have the richer vocabulary to articulate those nuances. The wheels term like propositions, I will explain that later, propositions, modality, accuracy, fluency, purpose of translation. So those terminology are the ones that I'm referring to. Those are the meta languages you can use to write a prompt to the chat GPT. So those are the important concepts. 
So I'm um, equipped with this meta language, we can provide a clearer guidance. For instance, they can instruct a translator to enhance the fluency of translation or to cross check for accuracy, especially if consistencies have not previously identified. Right, so you know when you talk to other translators, you use those terminology to communicate. So you you do the same thing with ChatGPT. So this understanding of meta language is crucial when interacting with systems like ChatGPT. So blah blah. I think I can stop this. So I will. So anyway, so that's that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna repeating myself. So historically, the depth and the precision of meta language have been uh, nurtured within linguistics, translation studies, and so forth. So in the future, the terminologies and the insight from the, those disciplines, such as translation studies, can shape how we craft prompts for tools like ChatGPT. So that emphasis on understanding and leveraging a meta language in the realm of an, a translation is a core takeaway I wish to impart today. So this is a very important slide, I think. But, but I know it's so conceptualized, so I will give you the more specific example from now on. Okay, so up to this summary, uh, the main differences are the two points. You can ask questions about translation and the language to the chat GPT that beyond the limitation of the convention, conventional MT. And that because they understand, chat GPT will understand the purpose of translation and so forth, they can be easily integrated into the translation workflow. So how do we actually do this? So I will show you uh, very, I mean, I will show you the specific example. So the first uh, chapter two in the book will introduce uh, something like this. Uh, I think the users has to understand the basic structure of the language. It is first, it is important to keep in mind that the language is composed of two major components, propositions and modality. Proposition relates to what you want to say. The modality is concerned with how we communicate what we want to say. Our communication is a combination of two elements, what we want to say, proposition, and how we want to say it, modality. So English sentences can be similarly uh, divided into propositions and modalities. Let's say this example, Mr. Yamada could have come to my office, haven't he? The part, Mr. Yamada, come to my office. So those are the parts uh, that com consisting of the propositions what we want to say, but could have and haven't we, uh, which coordinates how the information is conveyed. Those, those are the modalities. But sometimes it's difficult to distinguish the two parts, but the conceptually you understand you want you know, propositions and modalities. After you understand this, if you look at those three sentences like Yamada-san popped, popped by our office, Yamada-san should come to our office. Did the director Yamada, if, the, if referring to myself, I guess, uh, come to our office? Those three sentences are the same, I mean, the same in terms of proposition. Only modality changes. Okay, you get the idea, right? Once, once you understand the meta languages such as proposition and the modalities, you are now able to ask questions about the language to the chat GPT. Can you explain the differences between the three sentences below in terms of proposition and the modality? Okay. And that's the first question that I said, right? Okay, then ChatGPT can answer that. Certainly in linguistics, proposition is blah, blah, blah. Modality is blah, 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 like I said. And it will, it can explain the differences in those three sentences. Yamada-san popped by our office. The proposition is that the event of Yamada-san visiting the office has occurred. The modality, the sentence lacks modality. It is a straightforward statement of fact. Number two, Yamada-san should come to our office. The proposition is blah, blah, blah. Modality is uh, 
uh, deomnic deom modality is expressed through uh, the modal verb should, indicating a suggestion or recommendation or obligation for Yamada-san to visit the office and so forth. So you, you, you're getting, I mean, the point is you don't under, you, point is it's not that you have to understand the differences, but the thing is you can ask that kind of questions with the use of uh, the meta language. That's the point. So number three is like this. Given that, how are they related? So proposition actually, uh, the, uh, the proposition and the modalities correspond to accuracy and fluency aspect of translation quality. Okay, so that's the connection between that. And maybe I can even expand this concept. So accuracy errors, for example, in translation quality relates to propositions. In some ways, they may overlap with terminology errors. It is a terminology unification issues, for example. It is a matter of mechanical accuracy, uniformity and consistency, and in terms of conventional technology. Tools such as computer assisted translation or the translation memory have helped to ensure the quality of its accuracy aspects. So you see, it's not exactly aligned with each other, but you can kind of see. So the proposition is a very rule based things that relates to the accuracy. And then if you use that technologies like a cat, cat, cat tools uh, can be used to ensure your the accuracy is correct. However, however, those technologies like cat tools are not specialized for tasks such as rewriting to improve fluency or rewriting to take into account the style guide. So until now, human translators and the post editors have been responsible for this part of the work. With ChatGPT, however, the fluency part can also be rewritten at the prompt. So cat tools can benefit from the fluency that they have not been able to do so, so far. In this way, AI technology can advance in the sense that it can help us improve both propositions and modalities. So throughout the book, uh, the references to the translation studies and linguistics are used to further subdivide the issues of accuracy and fluency with the meta languages uh, interspersed throughout. So anyway, so uh, so you you now and I hope you understand those uh, the ideas propositions and modality, and the uh, so maybe I, uh, I will explain uh, some other uh, detailed categories underneath. But before that, uh, so it's obvious that what what's important in our communication is. Of course, the proposition is very important, but reality, how we say it, fluency is also important. Okay, I'm not going to read the script anymore. So uh, let's let's think about it. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm talking, my, I mean, I'm giving this lecture now. I think that my proposition is communicated to you, but maybe the way I present my presentation may not be. Fluency is lacking maybe, you know, that, that's the limitation me as an English speaker, English learners, right? Because my native, in, native language is not a, a Japanese. So fluency is always the issue. Accuracy is kind of easy. You, fluency can be learned through rule-based grammars. You know the syntax, you know the grammars, you can make yourself across at least as far as what you want to say, the propositions are considered. But fluency is always that. But MT, like the neural machine translation, they have all bunch of data that their fluency is very high. Also the chat GPT can create a very fluent English, right? So, you, I mean, what we want to say is, why don't we just take the advantage of this technology to improve your fluency aspect of your output? So that was also another important message in this book, especially targeting for the English learners. Okay, so let's uh, look at some of the uh, specific ideas for the propositions. You know that the term propositions, 
and proposition relates to syntax and semantics. Of course, you, you guys know already because you're in a, you know, specialized in the language. But, so I, I, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I, maybe in that perspective, I mean, this lecture is not, not as exciting, as, not academic as you know, it should be, but uh, yeah. Uh, but a lot of our language learners don't know this terminology, syntactic ambiguity or the dependency or this, that, that kind of thing. Uh, if you look at these three sentences, ambiguity in syntactic relations can occur in many languages, including English as well. So uh, here are some examples of sentences in English that have ambiguity due to dependency relations. So those are, try I'm trying to you know, throw those meta languages in the lecture. You know? The old men and women are, were at the gathering. The sentence is ambiguous because it's unclear whether both the men and women are old or just the men, right? Number two, visiting relatives can be tiring. <laughs> this sentence is ambiguous because it's unclear whether the relatives are visiting or the speaker is visiting the relatives. <laughs> Number three, I saw the man with the telescope. It's unclear, it's ambiguous whether the speaker saw the man by using a telescope or the man being seen has a telescope, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, this is another linguistic class. <laughs> That's an example, <laughs> sorry. Right. And the, uh, once again, now you know the meta language, uh, syntactic ambiguity or the dependency, you can ask questions. So can you explain the syntactic dependency of the following sentence? And all the men and the women are at the gathering and ChatGPT can answer perfectly like this. I'm not going to read this. I mean, but I, 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 I mean, I hope you get the idea. I know I'm repeating myself so many times. All right. But this book has, uh, because the Japanese version, so we, I, I, the, uh, the example that I use in the book is uh, the Japanese syntactic ambiguities. Uh, the translations below result. Okay, so this is, these are the two sentences has, has the, some kind of syntactic ambiguity. ambiguity. And the, uh, if you, the first, okay. The literal translation, the president of the company supported the employee who work at the company with his, with all his might or with all their might. So that, that, that dependency is, is the modifier is a very ambiguous. So these two has different meanings, but if you put these sentences in the existing machine translation, such as DeepL, uh, for some reason, they cannot distinguish these two. But with ChatGPT, of course, you can ask questions. Can you distinguish these two I mean, sentences in terms of dependency or the syntactic ambiguities? And uh, ChatGPT can respond. And given that response, so can you translate uh, two sentences? Then ChatGPT can do it. So the first one, the president supported employees who work with their whole heart and soul. So that was the first exactly correct translation from the original Japanese sentence. And the second one, the president wholeheartedly supported employees who work. Oh, it's okay. So, uh, so that's, yeah, that's the idea. Syntactic ambiguity, and also we have the semantic ambiguity. Uh, we have a Japanese, uh, a Japanese expression. The above Japanese, Sato-san has quit the job. Sato-san wa taishoku shimashita. This, uh, the original sentence was translated by DeepL like this, Mr. Sato retired. But this seems has an issue. So the conventional journal Japanese is uh, translated in, into English by machine translation. Comparing the two, we noticed two problems. One is the word retire is translated as retire, retire. But uh, depending on the context, I mean, okay. So uh, this does not mean that, that this person just quit the job. It doesn't mean the retires due to, like, I don't know, 65 and 70 years old or whatever, you know, it just quit. But uh, this translation retire narrow the multiple meanings of the source text. And also the Japanese saying this Sato-san, Yamada-san, Sato-san, this san does not uh, specify any gender, 
but MT somehow generates, decides it's a Mr. Sato, it's a gender bias is already learned through the machine translation. Okay, so that's the limitation again, but if you know that you can ask ChatGPT, please retranslate it with the lexical ambiguity or the semantic ambiguities, then okay, blah, blah, blah. Then the answer from the Mr. and Mrs. Sato has left the job or something like that. So anyway, so that's, that's I, I'm, I mean, get you, I, I hope you are, okay, maybe I should speed up a little bit. Okay, so that's the, uh, those example relates to the propositions, but the modalities has some, some issues as well. Uh, for example, uh, just, a, uh, okay, you, you have one source sentence like this, the back translations, I was surprised when the manager Yamada suddenly showed up at our drinking party yesterday. But we wanna translate two different ways. So you can ask questions. Please translate the following Japanese into English. However, please provide the English translation in a form that meets the following two communication purposes when translating. The first purpose is uh, the purpose of reporting a company executive in a business setting. So you, you want to report this sentence to the business uh, you know, executives. The second purpose of the telling close friends what you had at the company. Okay. If you ask that chat to the chat GPT, then response, the business communication, it's kind of not the real translations I'm writing to inform you that the director Yamada unexpectedly attended our gathering yesterday. This unexpected presence took us by surprise. <laughs> I mean, but, but you, you, you feel, get, you know, get, get the feeling of it's a business-like communication. But the casual communication with the close friend, you wouldn't believe it. Director Yamada suddenly showed up at our drinking party last night. It seriously freaked me out. So yeah, so the, these two different ideas. So uh, pragmatics, and this is very difficult to uh, 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 explain. But this, you know, the you know fluency is related to the pragmatics and, and as pragmatics aspect of the language. Uh, the literal translation, I am a cat, but this is, this is the code. It's, it's a one that very notable Japanese writer, Natsume Soseki's book is called, I am a cat, but it's, it's not a I am a cat. It's not like a wagahai wa neko de aru is very difficult to translate because it's a very old time. Cat is like a human, you know, figure calling some like a, you know, the head of the country cat, I am a cat, you know, that's, that's what it implied from this sentence. But you, if you translate it, I am a cat, doesn't, doesn't you know, imply that kind of dignity in the, you know, in the thing. So, so you, you ask questions. So please translate the following uh, Japanese in, uh, into English, consider pragmatic meaning when translating. Then you just put this source text and the chat GPT's answer. Okay, I am a cat, you see. <laughs> so, okay, that, okay, <laughs> okay, then, okay, then you ask question, okay, why, why you translated that way? Okay, then the answer was very wonderful. We have taken into account that the pragmatic meaning of Japanese text reflected the context, tone, and formality of a sentence in the English translation. So, wagahai wa neko de aru. In the original sentence, wagahai, I am, an article and somewhat uh, pompous, you know, I can't say that, way of referring myself is not commonly used in modern Japanese. To reflect this tone in English, we chose the translation, I am a cat, you see. And you see is expression that adds emphasis in such a formality, conveying the nuance of original sentence. I don't know if this is a successful translation, but, but at least the chat GPT is trying to do it. Expressive text. Kappa ga kapparatte yopparatta. You see the sound, right? Okay, so the kappa ga kapparatte yopparatta. This is just a pun. It's a, it's a pun, it, it's, it's a joke kind of, you know. So, uh, but, but literal translation, kappa is a very traditional figure of some, some kind of, what? The frog and the human combined, uh, uh, the ghost kind of thing got drunk by stealing, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's me, but it's, it's funny. 
because it's a kappa ga kappa. So, okay, so you ask, translate the following Japanese into English. However, please, oh, yeah, it, it disappeared. Please uh, rhyme, I think, I think. Arita, use the alliteration of the K sound uh, and then they make it rhyme in English. And uh, okay, here's a translation with alliteration using the K sound. I can't even read this in Japanese, English. Kappa, clumped, yeah, yeah, but you see that all the words starts with K. Try to make the alliteration of this. Do, do you know what I mean? So this can never be achieved through the existing translation, especially fluency, expressive text type. So anyway, so those are the things. I still have time, right? <laughs> All right, so you, you, you get the idea, right? So, okay, propositions and fluencies, and if you know some uh, the meta language, and you can ask questions, and you can get the, those flexible answers from ChatGPT. Okay, how, how we can actually apply this to the, the real workflow? So, uh, in, in the translation production process can be divided into three or two, I think. So there are two main types of prompts that I can think of. So these are the best uh, understood as stage of production process. And you know that produces a translation from source text. The production process can be divided into one pre-process, the process of determining the specifications of translations. And number two is a production process. Number three, the post process, the process of checking the quality of what has been produced. Since our translation production process is handled by large language model in the middle. So our role, human role is to provide prompts in stage one and three. We don't translate, we just prompt, okay? In other words, uh, these two types of prompts can be divided into two forms. One to determine the translation specifications and others to confirm that the translated result is acceptable. In the following, we will create prompts based on them referring to the actual translation field meta language used in those stages. I, in the book, if you buy it, if, of course you cannot read it, there's a link that you can go to. There's a the set of the prompts as a template you can refer to. So, so uh, the one example is like this. So pre-production prompt uh, examples. So you can, you know, it's always important to specify purpose of translation and target audience. So you use this format. So translate the following source text Japanese into English, please fulfill the following conditions when translating. Purpose of translation, you have to write that purpose and target audience you need to write. Then you paste your source text. Then, you know, you can use this as a, the prompt. So this is an actual example like this. So it's the same, same instruction, but the purpose you have to fit in. In this case, this source text, you don't did read this, but you get the idea. So the purpose of translation is to market our brand of cosmetics and to be displayed on our website. You know, so the text used in the website, cosmetics, target audience, women in their twenties. Okay, yeah. It just happened to be one or two sentences, but you can just paste more, you know, you know, one paragraph, two paragraphs but as a source text. So th this is the, the answer, uh, the translation I got uh, from ChatGPT under this prompt. Our uh, specially crafted foundation accentuates your natural beauty, seamlessly blending into your skin. It provides a finish that feels just like your own perfect skin. I don't know, is that a targeting for uh, the women in their twenties? <laughs> I don't know, are you attracted to buy these cosmetics by reading this? I don't know. I happened, I just used the same source text and put in the DPL and then I got the DPL answer. It's not bad, it's, it might be better, I don't know. Our foundation enhances your natural beauty. It blends seamlessly into the skin and provides a finish that looks like bare skin itself. I don't know which text you're better. But anyway, so the translator's job is to judge which one is better and you have to post it to this one, right? Okay, so. Anyway, so that's how, this is a pre-production prompt. 
But why don't you just do the post-production prompt as well? You can use ChatGPT to check the result, which one's better. So you ask the questions. Okay, what is the difference between the following two English sentences? Translation of ChatGPT or DeepL? Please explain it in terms of proposition and modalities so that I, I who am not very good at English can understand it, okay? And ChatGPT answers it. Do you put that those two results? And ChatGPT actually wrote like two pages of explanations and you know which one's better and you know proposition and modalities. So I just cut the middle off. But very importantly, toward the end of the explanation from ChatGPT, it says, for example, in the product advertising and marketing documents, detailed and rich expressions such as ChatGPT can enhance the appeal of product and attract consumers' attention. On the other hand, uh, the for users manual and the technical documentation, the direct and concise expressions like deep, okay, deep L, I mean, deep L translation may be better suited to convey information. So it says the first one's better for marketing, but deep L the text is better for more like the technical documentation. So I, I think, uh, you know, what they got. For real. So this is actually fits the purpose of this translation, the specification. So maybe you can use this judgment from ChatGPT to, to make your own judgment as a post editor or the translator. I'm not saying you always rely on ChatGPT's response, but this is the way you can use the ChatGPT. So this is the website I showed. It's all Japanese, but you can translate this. And so this is a prompt, uh, the website. This, there's uh, so many prompts that I provided in this book. I, I know I don't want to go, you know, I explain all the prompts that I used, but some some people are concerned with, can we use uh, ChatGPT as a terminology uh, consistency purpose? And you, you can do that. So please, uh, the correct, the bilingual translation in the glossary when I'm mean, not a correct, I mean, I don't know. This was actually deep well translation. So you please use, uh, okay, okay, no, no, never mind. Please use the correct bilingual translation in the glossary when translating the original into English. And you provide a glossary. The glossary is a bilingual glossary of Japanese and English. It is a comma, comma separated CSV format. And so you just type term one, term two. So this is the format, then you just paste your uh, the original text. In that way, when translation is produced, they those terminology will be inconsistent with those the glossaries you provided. Just like work as a cat tools, you know. Okay, so so that's the pre-production side. But again, I, I kind of mentioned the post-production aspect. You can use ChatGPT for accuracy. Uh, error uh, check or the fluency check thing. So I think you already got the idea. So I'm, I'm a, this is a repetition of what I kind of told, but you can give kind of product, I mean, the prompt. You are the professional translation checker, reviser. Please compare the Japanese source text and with the English in the translated text and check for accuracy errors or where the proposition in the source text are lost in the translated text. If there are any suspected accuracy errors, please extract those parts and explain them. And finally, please provide a correct translation that corrects those errors. So I just put uh, some source text and translated text from DeepL and have the chat GPT do the quality check for accuracy errors. You can do the fluency errors as well. And actually they did uh, uh, detect some of the errors, number of errors are actually contained and it can detect it. Of course, it's not 100% reliable. Sometimes they just bullshit. <laughs> you know, they lied and the, uh, you know, uh, they, they found uh, some, some errors, but yeah, but, but it, it can be useful. So I think those are the things uh, I mainly wanted to express. If we have a few more minutes, yeah. And so I so that's to that point, mainly what that's what I said in, in a book. And if you are interested in it, and 
maybe you purchased it. I don't know. <laughs> How can you read this, right? <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, okay. But, but I'm, I'm working on uh, developing further the more prompts and to be applied in, in the research and more techniques. The one, that, one thing I did was I presented in this MT summit in a couple months ago, uh, the prompt for the dynamic equivalence. Or I, I assume you know what the dynamic equivalence is. That's uh, using NIDA says, you know, kind of substituting words. So dynamic equivalence. So that kind of, that, you know, that idea can be used as a prompt. So you just put the definitions of what the dynamic equivalence is. Dynamic equivalence is the strategy for translating from the perspective of equalizing the reader's response to the source text and the target text in the example. And also, it's good to provide specific example for ChatGPT to understand the definitions. For example, in the example below, the word lamb in the original text would be translated as lamb. No, no, that it doesn't make sense, does it? Seal, seal in the, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, that, right. Lam in the literal translation, however, when translating for Iceland, which has no sheep, <laughs> where no sheep are, well, it is difficult to convey the nuance of word lam from the standpoint of equalizing reader's reaction. This is a, a reuse of translate it as a seal. It is believed that lam in the source text and seal in the target text in the Iceland will evoke the same reaction in the reader. So you source text the lam of God and the target is seal, it's replaced. Okay, following this concept and example, please translate the following source text into English using the dynamic equivalence. Please replace the translation with something that would be understood in English speaking culture. And the source text, you won't be able to read this, but, but I will show the example in the next page. Oh, ah, ah, shit. Yeah, this happens. Yeah, okay, so this slide is completely wrong. Yeah, okay, so I have to explain this. Okay, it says, it says, a uh, her singing voice reminds me of a singer, Misora Hibari. It's a very famous singer, Misora Hibari. You have no idea who that this is, right? Her voice reminds me of uh, Misora Hibari. So you wanna translate it into English using the dynamic equivalence, meaning you have to think of who you can replace with this, uh, you know, this uh, Misora Hibari. Then I don't have the uh, slides, but <laughs> yeah, this, this is different. Uh, what we got is uh, one is uh, Judy Garland, <laughs> Judy Garland, and, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, and some other person I forgot. But anyway, I mean, I think, yeah, Misora Hibari who died 20 years ago, but he, he was very active and one of the most famous beautiful voice singer in, in the 60s and 70s. So the chat DVD tried to come up with a very great singer's equivalent the English singers like the Judy Garland or the Fida Tetzgerald back in, you know, very active in the 60s. And so uh, what I'm saying is, yeah, they can do the uh, uh, dynamic equivalence. I know some people think, Amy, isn't that too much to put all those prompts to just get the one singer like this, right? But I think the, to me the chat, I mean, the dynamic equivalence is one of the aspects the very creative aspect of in translation. Do you know what I mean? So I mean, so some people, I mean, criticize technologies for lack of creativity, but but I think, yeah, it can be a creative. They can come up with someone who is equivalent, dynamically equivalent relationship to the person or something like that. So I think this is nice, and I just wanted to share that. I, I think I have already, uh, oh, this is not you, Yamada, Masaru Yamada, the, this one was translated by ChatGPT, not a ChatGPT, DeepL, so has some errors. Most of the slides actually is translated by DeepL, and then I, you saw some errors and stuff, but that's all right. Uh, so I hope you get the idea what I'm trying to make across. Uh, 
yeah, I, I wanted to emphasize that I'm not saying chat GPT is perfect for producing perfect translation on the or checking the quality. But I guess that uh, once again, my, my message is that you can use those meta languages, also the terminology you studied in the translation studies, and then they create a prompt so that that chat GPT can may be able to do more than what you think. And just idea is why don't you try and in the era, you know, to play with it, the technologies and to see what we can do. And that's all I think for my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Masaru. Um, you realize that this was a kind of a risky presentation, right? But I think it really corresponds <laughs> to the type of lectures that we want with um, new ideas, new questions, and also some examples that people always want to discuss, right? With idioms, with a uh, lot of content that really challenge our way to translate. So they also um, are good examples to be used when we are testing the technology. I guess there are questions from the audience and I'm going to uh, ask Sarah to uh, pass the microphone. Uh, any questions for now? No? Yeah. Does this work? Yes. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, so we know that uh, it has always been necessary for a translator or interpreter to have this linguistic and cultural uh, ability, knowledge uh, to be able to translate in the language pair. More recently, we have, uh, with the recent um, involvement of technology, we have started to teach uh, programming skills, uh, the use of tools. So from what you have uh, explained, uh, exemplified, can we say that uh, there's an emerging skills for translators, for future translators, uh, which is necessary uh, the use of meta language uh, to be able to provide the chat GPT or, or any other large language models uh, to provide it with uh, the correct um, prompts, mm. pre and post prompts. So this is how I felt from the examples because uh, of the pace of the technology getting into the profession. I think this might be an emerging skill, so we mm. might need to go back to linguistics and teach this as a new <laughs> yeah, skill, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about this? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I, I think there, it, it has a very important message, I think. I think, yeah, even though I said the meta language is important, but I think meta language is not fine grained enough to describe all the phenomena of the language. So uh, the, as a researcher, the scholars, there's still a lot of rooms for us to develop finer, fine, finer grained meta language on the one hand. But uh, for the emerging job or the skills are the maybe the prompt engineering for translation. Yes, I, I, I strongly think so in at least for, I don't know if that, prompt engineering for translation is an everlasting job. Maybe it, it's only good for next three years or five years, but I think uh, nobody knows what kind of a potential the, the large language model has. So only way to communicate with ChatGPT, the large language model is through prompt. Then I think the, the best candidates for communicating with large language model about translations are the ones who has the language to communicate with. So the prompt, the prompt crafting is very important. So I, I think, yeah, yeah, in that perspective, uh, I don't wanna say that should be included in the curriculum for the master's program, but I think it's a very important aspect that we should take into consideration. I think we should include some weeks of activities that involves uh, the prompt engineering. Yeah, for because I think I think translation scholars, professional translators are the very good candidates for 
creating good prompts for translating. I don't think all the translators want to create prompts in the daily life, you know. So if you work for uh, the industry and some translation companies, maybe there should be some people who are working, creating the prompting and provide to, with the translators and revisers to use that prompt in the workflow. So I don't think everyone should do it. No, I think that some dedicated people should do it. Yeah, I think there's an opening for that and opportunities, yes. <laughs> um, as we wait for more questions from the room, we have around 200 people watching this online and there are a couple of questions coming from there. So we're going to listen to some of those questions, okay? Okay, so the first question we've got is from Valerie Florentin. Florentin. Um, knowing how these models are trained with biases, for example, how can we trust that the explanation is valid without knowing the language and the culture? <laughs> <laughs> Big question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the we always have that questions, right? I mean, you know, we have the ma machine translation. How can we trust the machine translation? The output is correct. Then there are always the post editors. And now we ask questions, they explain about the cultural differences and all, then how can we trust that? Yeah, there should be a post editor to, yeah, post edit it. So, uh, yeah, I have no answer to that question, but the, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. If that person is here, I want to ask that question. What do you think? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll move to the second question. So uh, in relation to your book, this is from Stavroula Sokoli. Uh, a question about the process of writing your book. Consti considering the constant evolution of chat GPT, for example, what you could do a month ago, you can't do any longer, and vice versa. Mm. The results are always different. How do you deal with this constant change of a tool that you have no control over? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In terms of the accuracy of information we get from the language language models, I, I would say that it's getting in, keep improving, right? So I, I think we can take advantage of the evol evolutions. I mean, so like, uh, how can we trust the answer from the chat GPT? But maybe two months later, it can be more trusted, you know, yeah, I mean, trustworthy. So, uh, so uh, uh, I mean, so that's one aspect, but the other one is, uh, mm. <laughs> I, I tried not to narrow the knowledge I'm sharing you with you today, just, uh, just how to use ChatGPT. That's why I, try to introduce the meta language to make best use out of it, right? So I think what I talk today can last for the time being, even though the technology will evolve in the next couple of years, I think, yeah. So that's, but, but I'm so excited about it. Now, uh, you know, the chat GPT, the newest version has the, uh, the ability to generate the pictures based on the text, right? So I use the technology to, to check. I use with the students, okay, we put the source text, have the AI generate some kind of pictures. Then you translate the text, you put the translation in the AI to see do you, you get whether you get the same pictures to the source text. You know, some people think you know, translation is not the text, but also the, you know, the pictures in your mind. And you can actually generate the pictures to compare other things. But at, because of the quality now, you, you cannot rely on the, the pictures they draw at this point. But I, I hope in maybe 10, I mean, two years, I think we can use that functions to, for the uh, translation quality uh, assessment or something like that. So there's a pros and cons in, in this development, I would say. Uh, we have one more question from online for now, just one moment. Uh, this is from Margaret Rogers. 
Um, so given the need to prompt specific terms and their translations in pre-production, so that's not straightforward, would it be right to conclude that ChatGPT is less useful for specialized translation? Uh. <laughs> yeah, realistically speaking, yes, or oh, my, in my opinion, yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, that this general chat GPT, large language model knows, seem to know superficially about everything about the world. But when it comes to, let's say, medical translation, very specialized terminologies and jargons, uh, yeah, they can not deal with it. But, but, not, but still you can teach it. I mean, you think about it. I, I, I mean, you can always, it's easy to criticize the technology, the limitations of technologies, but we, you, you are given like two, some, some like 4,000 tokens to train the chat GPT as you want right now. I think the token lengths will expand. What I'm saying is, okay, those are the terminologies used for this documentation translation. You teach it first, then, then have it generated then it can, it's, it, it, it acts like a customized MT for this moment. So uh, if you teach it, you can customize it, then customize it, custom, custom, you know, customizing it, it's much easier than before. I mean, if you think about it, if you want to make your own customized machine translation, what kind of data you have to, how many days you have to deal with to customize the specific MST for specific domain. So I, I think, yeah, do you know what I mean? So it's a, there's a pros and cons. <clears throat> no more questions from the audience? No? So I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Um, you emphasized quite well that this meta language is necessary for us to get at least several alternatives of the translation. and to see how it gets better. Does this mean that being a translator really um, is needed for us to get good translations from ChatGPT? Does translators need to know? Mm Um, if I could just add a quick note to our online participants. Um, thank you to those who have got your hands raised to ask questions. If you could please put your question in the Q&A so that we can read it out because we don't have the mic enabled for online. Thank you. I, up until a couple of months ago, yes, I believe that the old translator should be able to use meta language to explain their work and, you know, the communication with ChatGPT. But, Somehow, I'm, I start seeing a lot of a divide between people who want to do it and people who don't. And the, uh, I, I, right now, I think it's not mandatory for all the translators to use the meta language to, to prompt. I, I think the prompt has to be created by someone who really want to do it then they share the prompt with those prompt translators and the, 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 some of the translators just use it to produce whatever the translation they need. So I don't think it's, they don't, they have to create the prompt, nor they have to know the meta language. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, do you think ChatGPT is better as a language teacher or better as a translator? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I think I think so. I mean, uh, in in many ways, it's better. Maybe it's not their ability is better, but somehow <laughs> the society, the, the among the teacher language teachers are more accepted. In, in at least in, in my country, uh, they are so excited. Then I think the the trend is that those teachers want to use, make the use of that technology in the classroom. And the, uh, 
I think a lot of universities in Japan are adopting the chat GPT in the classroom so that a lot of uh, language learners can self-learn uh, the language by using it and all, on so forth. And when I talk about this kind of thing in front of a professional translators, no matter how good result they saw, it's not, I mean, you know, yeah, the translation is good, but the process is not, this is not how we translate, you know, or something like that. So the, the discussions on, of ongoing and, you know, so uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I know, I mean, I, I know, maybe I said something wrong now. <laughs> I kind of regret, no, no. What I'm saying is, uh, uh, mm. yeah. Uh. I'm sorry, I, I, I cannot, <laughs> yeah. Um, so as we all know that uh, with technology developing so fast and uh, we've already, you know, applied the different technology, especially in translation. And um, I want to know, um, you know, to what extent we can depend on like chat GPT? Because for some specific questions, chat GPT is doing, I think, much better even than humans. And <laughs> yeah, so to what extent we can depend on that technology? And um, uh, a lot of people using chat GPT uh, write articles, essays, and even got some reports in in jobs. So I want to ask, what's the point of being a translator since you have been working for a professional <laughs> translator? Yeah, thank you. Good, th thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, that's a very important question, right? Uh, I will repeat myself uh, that te technically speaking, the presentation today is focused on the directionality of into translation, I mean, into English translations, right? When it comes to translating into Japanese or some other, other than English, the quality is not as good as maybe existing machine translations or human translators. So uh, I think for that purpose, still, a human translator do much better job than ChatGPT. But when it comes to into English translations, I think the question is very become serious. I mean, it's very critical. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I still really worry about what what is the you know English translators reason for existence, right? And the uh, uh, but but still, a lot of text has high risk text. You know, one error causes uh, the fatal you know crisis or something like that. So uh, still, I mean, translators' job is not going to go away anyway. But but let's say so we, that's that's another job for us, professional you know professional translator or the professional translator as a consultant, and in thinking of which application is best. So we have to think of that. One one of the options that I'm thinking is now. I mean, a lot of the contents of the YouTube in the cultural bound, like the Japanese, you know, kind of funny, stupid contents, but if that is, is translated into English, and I'll, also I did not introduce the technology, but we can actually use AI to yourself, make yourself speak English, dub in, in uh, movies, so as that movie looks like you are speaking English, doing this in the YouTube, that kind of contents can be exported and in the English countries and globally, and I think there's so much demands and you know anything. Then if there's some errors in in the kind of funny YouTube, I, I think the risks are very low. And people just you know think it's funny and enjoy the contents. We have so many animes and mangas and and maybe the one percent are, are the only translated it into English and exported. And if those uh, the contents are export, I mean translated using those chat GPT, I think. We have a lot of a uh, uh, chance, maybe on the economic way. I mean, you know. So, uh, so anyway, so 
you, you think of, I think there's a risk for the existing translators, but I think there's a, so many opportunities for those professional professions. And thanks. Um, thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, I mean, there are interesting questions. So, but I think the, the last um, or the most recent question, if I have understood this correctly, was also about this question, are we then not, do we still need the translators, right? That was what is you said, Everything what is then the point yes. of having yeah, the translators? <laughs> so, and I mean, um, so we've all tried ChatGPT, we've all played with it and playfully created certain things. And I think some of the points that you have shown how it helps us to get behind a metaphor, your cats and all of this, the rice and the cats, I think. Um, but um, shouldn't we also use this debate in a way to, to make it, to demonstrate, which is I think also what you've done here today because your this wasn't really targeted only at professional translators or not even in the first place. That's what you said right at the beginning, if I remember correctly. So, but if we, if we transpose some of these questions to the pro, uh, context of professional translation, I would wonder about ethical questions. There are some questions in the chat about this. Maybe we can come back later. I would of course wonder about the time that was already mentioned earlier. So if I go there to check everything and if I translate into my second language and then I still don't know, is that answer actually reliable? I have to go somewhere else and I have to check this out so you know and you you said all that i appreciate that you know so shouldn't we also use this debate to really despite all the opportunities they are fantastic but also to show okay what's what's not quite right or what would make you stop and you mentioned risk you know and my my fear is not so much that um this is actually going to be faster or quicker than a professional translator i'm i'm not so sure about this but my concern is also that it goes down to literacy. I don't know whether Lynn is here, Lynn Barker, but, um, mm. but it goes to literacy um, where we have this big debate about machine translation literacy, where the clients understand enough about the positives and the drawbacks about machine translation. Should we not also stimulate that a lot more, sort of the basically chat GPT translation literacy? I'm sure I'm not the first one to think about this here, but um, you know, to, to show all those sides and all those contrasts, because my, my concern is more that in light of current debate, where everybody goes, yeah, wow, this thing is great. Look, it can write better than me. It can write an essay faster than I can. Yeah, and that clients of translation will of course think exactly what they have been thinking about machine translation and so on and so forth. So maybe we can think about that a little bit, what we should tell clients of translation about the capability of this and the limitations of this and not with this aim of don't use it. This is a real, that's not realistic. People will use it, but to, to create more of an awareness what it is good for and what it isn't maybe. Yeah, I, I so, uh, so still, so that, yeah, ethical aspects and all that still, yeah, we need, we need professional translators, but for, for translation training, I think we should, yeah, have time to discuss this and also train students about the literacy to those AI technologies and so forth. So, uh, including all that, I, I think you guys are the one who know about all this advantages and disadvantages and, you know, limitations and, and all, everything. So I, I did not talk about that, but yeah, it would be nice if we have that kind of time to talk about it. I mean, I only introduced the technical aspects and quality aspects of this, but uh, I hope this will help you understand about this technology better. Okay. Um, this is related to the previous two questions. It's very similar. Um, my question is: Do you do you think ChatGPT will eventually, in a few years, reduce the the translation profession to just a post editing job? If you ask that questions, and in, in the in the in the last chapter that in this book has a section that talks about that kind of questions. The so one question, yeah. 
that's exactly the same. What I answered, I quote myself, I would say. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I see this technology as a automatic sushi restaurant, like rotating sushi restaurant. Have you seen that thing? When that technology came, all the professional sushi maker criticized that. That's not that kind of, that's not sushi. It's, it's not sushi, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's a rotating sushi created by machines. But, but now it's much popular than the very professional expensive sushi restaurant. In Japan, like my kids likes the, the rotating sushi. And also that technology is exported globally. And you, I, I'm sure you have enjoyed that, like that kind of thing. The once you're exposed to that things, you get to know about, okay, this is a sushi. And maybe sometime I wanna eat real sushi. Let's go to Japan then have a nice sushi restaurant or something. So I think the rotating sushi is artificial. It, maybe it's not real translation, not sushi thing, but still it's a sushi kind of thing. And, and that demand is increases. Then I think the real professional, nice sushi restaurant demand also in, increases. Do, do you know what I mean? So overall, I think the market for uh, the trans sushi is still, I mean, increasing because of that rotating sushi technologies. So I think this hap this is hap that's that's what I see the similarity in these uh, translations. I mean, there's so many texts every day that like more than 99% of the text is translated through the machine translating, machine translation. There's so much high demands for translation than human can translate. So then, then people has to use those technology for to, to generate the translations. Then I'm sure they will see some troubles with those wrong translations and translation data. They come back to the professions and you know they wanna they want higher quality translation eventually. So that cycle is ongoing. And I think so. My my answer is no, no. I think the profession. That the market for professional, professional translator will increase. That's that's how I see. Okay, so one of the questions online from Maria Bruno is: Could ChatGPT be used for both translation and review using prompts similar to? those you gave, like, for example, the pragmatic slide, um, she qualifies, what I mean is, would it make sense to use the same model and data to produce a translation and check its quality too? Mm. Uh, the good, 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 good point, good point. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, mm. Maybe not, right? I mean, same translator and a different reviewer has to review the translation. So now that technically you try ask ChatGPT4 to translate and ask the same model to check it. Uh, but but the, uh, there's a that parameter you can play with. It's a temperature, it says in a ChatGPT. Right now, the default setting is in the middle. So every time you ask the same question, the ChatGPT generates a different answers. Uh, as far as the, the temperature is uh, the set in the middle, so every time you ask the same question, you get a different answer. So it's not reliable. But so I haven't tried that yet. But I will minimize the temperature to see they, if they have the consistent uh, the answers. And the uh, anyway, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm I cannot really answer the questions. Probably theoretically no. Maybe we should use different models. But I haven't done any empirical uh, experiment to prove it's not useful or not. So there's a room for the research. Maybe you can do that research for your PhD. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and another question this time from um, Gurkhan Dogru. Um, I'll paraphrase this because it's quite a long question. Um, you mentioned that LLMs like ChatGPT can be easily integrated into cat all environments. Um, how would you imagine that integration taking place? Would it be like the NMT plugins? Um, how, how would you see that occurring? Uh, uh, I also work as a consultant with those vendors, tool vendors. 
So, I mean, they are thinking of many ways to apply this uh, the technology into the cat tools. But I work with cat tool com companies. Some companies try to uh, have the users write the prompt, I mean, the purpose of translation and the audience first. So it works the same way as the regular cat tools and the, you know, MT respond displayed on the right side or something in the, as a reference. But before you start the task, you have to specify the purpose of a translation and audience. And then the, the chat GPT output is displayed. So that's the one way to uh, work and integrate it to the CAD tools. The other one is somehow <laughs> this, some guy wants to pre-edit the source text before putting the M regular MT. So they use the same uh, the MT engines, but they pre-edit the source text by using the chat GPT prompt. So, so that's so there are so many uh, yeah ways to apply. So there's another issue or another task that you can think of. Did I answer? Yeah. Well, the session is already very long. We're going to ask just one more question. Okay, if you can <laughs> answer that one. <laughs> Okay, this question is my own actually. Oh. Um, it, <laughs> um, it's in relation to Japanese and English, but it can be applied to other languages where um, politeness and respect are kind of part of the language. So I'm just curious to know if you've done any experimentation or uh, developed any prompts in relation to um, Kego, you know, um, oh. polite, respectful Japanese, that it's very difficult to convey the, the layers of that in English, mm. whether you've done it in one direction or another, and if so, what kind of results did you get? Did you have to develop prompts around it? Just curious. I kind of showed one similar example, right? Like the you know, communicating with executives and your you know colleagues. That, but that the trick is that it's from Japanese to English. Then they can do a better job, you know changing around the way of uh, honorific expressions. But if I if I ask ChatGPT to generate Japanese expressions with Keigo honorific expressions, they, they are not doing great job. So that's still the issue that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um... As I think uh, we promised, this was a very rich lecture with um, lots of food for thought about how this new technology can be used, about how translation is changing our roles and uh, our responsibility and so on. Um, uh, Masaru and I have been discussing these, uh, these matters for a while and we don't agree in everything, but, uh, <laughs> but that's exactly what we are trying to do with these lectures. So uh, thank you very much for your time, for the questions. Thank you. <laughs>